right, uh, I think uh, we're all settling down now. Uh, if you want to, you don't have to, but uh, since we're now half the number that we were before, if some of you from the back would like to move to the front, but you don't have to, but uh, it makes the discussion a bit easier. Um, for, first of all, introduce myself. I'm Saif Islam. I'm at the University of Bath. Um, I have a lovely connection with the Royal Society. I was sitting on the diversity committee for a couple of years, chaired by the fantastic Uta Frith, as mentioned earlier, just walked in. And um, it's a real privilege to serve on that committee. It's done, I think, some really good strategy and analysis of data out there. I'm chairing this session, and again, it's a privilege to chair this session. And as you could tell from the program, the theme is around education and curriculum. And I think we've got a really lovely, diverse bunch of speakers. And let me introduce our first speaker. And uh, I'll get my notes. Um, and that's Alice. Pinney. Uh, Alice is a member of the Girl, Guide, Girl Guiding National Youth Panel, Advocate. And uh, Advocate is a group of 18 Girl Guiding members aged 14, 25, who influenced the direction of the charity's research and advocacy. Um, Alice was keen for, to, for me to mention she's 17. <laughs> and, so, uh, and she's doing her A-levels at the moment and hoping to study engineering at some point. So, Yes. <laughs> so, uh, without further ado, let me introduce Alice up to the front. So, Alice, give a big warm welcome to Alice. Awesome. Thank you very much. Right, so I'm really excited to be here today because it's the Royal Society. Um, so, yeah, as it's been said, my name's Alice, and I'm here today on behalf of um, Girl Guiding, the UK's leading charity for girls and young women. Um, we've actually got over half a million members, uh, which includes, I think, something like 100,000 volunteers. <laughs> Um, and as the UK's leading charity for girls, we're really passionate about ensuring that girls are not limited by gender stereotypes, but are free to be themselves. Uh, we have weekly meetings held throughout the country, allowing girls to express themselves and grow as people in a girls-only space, free of these gender stereotypes, which means that girls can grow in confidence whilst not being held back by society's expectations. Um, this allows girls to go out into the world and not be as affected by the gender stereotypes that they really are experiencing in the worlds around them. Empowering girls to be their best despite these gender stereotypes is one of the most amazing things that Girl Guiding does. Girl Guiding wants to ensure that girls have equal opportunity and exposure to STEM and that they do not feel constrained by gender stereotypes when choosing a career, uh, really proving that girls can do anything. Girl Guiding has uh, revamped and will shortly be launching a new program in the new year, uh, something which I'm actually really excited about because um, it's designed to address the issues that girls are facing in society today, uh, which includes the gender stereotypes that girls are facing in STEM. Uh, one of the best things about this program is the introduction of the new badges. Uh, I can't wait to try them out, um, and, but also lead them in Brownie and Guide units, units being like the weekly meetings held all over the country. The introduction of these badges, things like coding and stargazing, means that girls feel like they'd have just as much right as boys to study these subjects. Furthermore, giving girls the opportunity to have exposure to these subjects, especially subjects which like, they might not have the opportunity to study at school, means that girls are given the opportunity to learn about a new subject in a fun way and develop their interest. Exposure is such an important part of getting more girls involved in STEM. Girl Guiding is really helping with igniting girls' interest in STEM through exposure. Uh, bringing film, uh, female STEM role models into unit meetings, showing that Girl Guiding is working on both a local and national level to encourage and inspire more girls to enter the field of STEM. Uh, my local Trefoil Guild, which is um, like the adult guiding unit, has organised a lecture by a microbiologist, um, which is open to all members of the county. Girls are being given this opportunity to hear about careers in STEM and ways that they can address, um, access these opportunities and also have a role model to look up to, something which I think is severely lacking in today's STEM society. Um, Girl Guiding is also really privileged to have partnerships with pioneering STEM-inspiring companies uh, such as Microsoft, Google and Rolls-Royce. Brownies are introduced to STEM in units through the Science Investigator Badge, which is supported by Rolls-Royce and helps to inspire the next generation of scientists. This exposure to STEM through these companies means that girls really feel like they have a place in STEM and they can be inspired to go on and learn more after gaining an interest in a subject. However, girls really are facing issues when entering the STEM workforce. And it's these issues that mean that, despite numerous campaigns, there's only been an increase of 0.2% since 2012 of women in STEM, meaning that as of 2015, women only make up 12.8% of the STEM workforce. 
Um, and as a woman who's planning to enter the STEM workforce, I actually found this really discouraging. It's unnerving and requires quite a lot of confidence to commit to a career that's going to be both challenging in terms of the subject area, but also the environment we're entering. It's a daunting challenge that does intimidate some people and is a real reason why girls are being deterred from entering the STEM field. Furthermore, Girl Guiding's actually found out that girls aren't being given the opportunity to study STEM subjects at school. From a young age, in school environments, girls are being actively discouraged from studying STEM and they're not being equipped with the, the skills they need to enter the STEM. Um, moreover, girls have said that a lack of female STEM teachers in school is a major factor discouraging them from pursuing a STEM career. From a young age, girls are being, uh, receiving the image that STEM is a field better suited to men and boys and these gender stereotypes are being reinforced, deterring girls from entering STEM from a young age. In schools, girls taking STEM subjects are seen as like different from the norm, or maybe uh, labelled as boyish, which is another reason that girls are being pressured out of STEM subjects. The point here is that all these reasons that girls don't want to st study STEM comes down to one thing, gender stereotypes. Upon examination, it can be seen that the underlying cause of all of this is society's expectations on girls, which are holding them back from entering the STEM workforce. So the solution to this problem that we at Girl Guiding want to see is the destruction of these gender stereotypes in society. If the expectations that girls are being held to are actively removed from society, then there's going to be nothing holding them back from achieving their dreams if they want to enter STEM. From a young age, children are being surrounded by gender stereotypes, like we saw earlier, like coming from toys, books, clothes. Um, we're seeing that gender stereotypes are affecting these girls' confidence, how they behave, and even how they participate in class, with over half of girls aged 11 to 21 saying that gender stereotypes affect what they say. <coughs> Challenging these gender stereotypes in society will contribute um, to increasing girls' overall confidence when entering STEM. As an organisation, Girl Guiding is challenging these stereotypes and equipping girls uh, to do whatever they want in many different ways. Through Girl Guiding, I've gained many unique skills which have equipped me for life. Uh, like My best example is um, my first trip away from home was with Girl Guiding, which uh, really gave me some massive vital independent skills and the confidence to engage with people without my parents. Working groups from a young age with different groups of people, often whom you're not particularly familiar with, has really strengthened my communication skills. I remember working in groups at Rainbows to complete tasks during weekly meetings, memories which I can look back on and smile, because one of the most powerful things about Girl Guiding is the fact that ordinary challenges run by extraordinary leaders give amazing and powerful results. As a young leader, I have the privilege of watching girls grow and develop into amazing individuals with the skills they need to enter the world fighting these gender stereotypes. Girl Guiding also equips girls to be leaders. 63% of girls say they want to be leaders in their chosen job, but to do this you need the skills of a good leader. Through working as a team and leadership opportunities within units, Girl Guiding empowers all girls to be leaders in their chosen field. I have the confidence to be a young leader through the communica communication skills I've cumulatively gained throughout my time at Girl Guiding, something which has enabled me to lead unit activities at my Brownian Guide units and also speak at events like this. It's only through Girl Guiding that I've gained the confidence to do many of the things I've achieved in my life. And throughout Girl Guiding, I'm sure the sentiment will be echoed. Julie Bentley, who's the CEO of Girl Guiding and absolutely awesome, said that what she loves about Girl Guiding is that for two hours a week, you can be anyone you want to be. It's a free space and time. It's this unique aspect of Girl Guiding which allows girls to throw off these gender stereotypes and be free in themselves and their abilities. Within unit meetings, there are no gendered expectations and restrictions for girls. Girls can do anything and be anything. Within this space, girls can experience a world with no gender stereotypes. Breaking free of these means that girls leave me meetings feeling empowered and free of the boxes that society has put girls in. This means that girls feel they can do anything and empowered to be their best. And this is the attitude that we want to encourage at Girl Guiding. So girls can be empowered to both study and be leaders in science, technology, engineering and maths and create an equal STEM workforce in the future. Thank, you. Thank you, Alice for a beautiful presentation. Um, I think we're going to have um, the sequence of talks first and then right at the end we're going to have a bit of a group discussion and then it'll be open to the floor for further questions and I'm sure there'll be lots of debate and good questions afterwards. So our next speaker, uh, to my notes, uh, pleasure to introduce Catherine Sparks. Um, so Catherine, uh, amongst many things, uh, founded Flamingo Creative, a corporate responsibility consultancy which helps business, businesses function ethically. Um, currently acting as a CEO for a variety of charities 
and in particular, uh, Lightyear Foundation. And I think we're going to hear more about um, related work in the presentation now from Catherine. So let's welcome Catherine. So, um, so my name's Catherine, I'm from the Lightyear Foundation. We're a charity dedicated to breaking down the barriers to STEM for all. Our flagship programme is called Sensory Science, and it's specifically looking at engaging disabled children and young adults with science. There are 770,000 disabled children aged under 16 in the UK. That's around one child in every 20. Disabled people remain significantly less likely to be in, in employment than non-disabled people. In the STEM world, 13.5% of the workforce are disabled, which is just a little bit below average across all the sectors. But we believe that STEM offers a real um, accessible way into the workforce with lots of, lots of great opportunities. So to tackle this, we created our Sensory Science programme. We have two tiers. The first one is our sensory science workshops, and our second is a work experience programme for young disabled adults. I'm going to flick through a few photos as I talk, so to help bring it to life a little bit. So our tier one workshops are interactive, vibrant workshops, predominantly delivered in special schools, but also by a charity and community groups. They're led by a unique combination of a drama professional and a scientist working together, we use lots of experiments, lots of sensory equipment to help bring it to life, so it's really, really engaging. We use storytelling, so we have a lovely story that weaves all the way through to help ease the transition between experiments. And our sensory equipment helps engage um, children across, uh, across the sessions. And depending on the various disabilities, we will tailor them accordingly. So, for example, a child who's visually impaired will have lots more tactile things, lots of lovely smells and different ways to help them really engage with the story and, and ease them through the transitions. We work with children from primary age to young adults, um, and they will have a complete range of disabilities. So Down syndrome, autism, significant speech and language needs. They may be nonverbal, they may have processing difficulties. We also have children with a wide range of physical needs, including cerebral palsy and also life-limiting conditions. Our content is linked into the national curriculum, so either around the P levels or the lower key stages. And we build scientific knowledge and conceptual understanding and reinforce, reinforce working scientifically. Our sessions are all interactive. They're, we flex as we go along, so they're very much led by the children's curiosity and their questions. Um, and we adapt it to, to meet their interests and what they want to know. Overall, our aims are to create opportunities for disabled children to have fun and develop life skills. We want to raise their aspirations to showcase science as a viable career option within the disability community. And we want to support teachers by reinforcing the curriculum in a creative way. Mainstream schools have, often have lots of visitors going in and doing lots of science um, events and activities, and special schools tend not to. Um, and because of that, we have a huge waiting list of schools wanting our workshops, and often we get um, invited back um, many times to do, to do different themes. So on that, we have a range of themes. Um, you can see from some of the pictures, we have our space workshops, um, which are a lovely journey into, into space. We teach transferable life skills, um, the key things are choice making, resilience, dealing with unexpected outcomes. Um, our, most recent, uh, our most recent workshop, oh, oh, this is our alien art, which is very exciting, <laughs> one of my favourite experiments. And actually it's really lovely because um, even children with very poor motor control, um, you have some, some children want to place all the little skittles very beautifully and create fabulous things. But equally, even if you just throw them onto a plate and add some water, you can still create really beautiful beautiful pictures. Our latest edition is our human body workshop. This is all about familiarising disabled children with medical environments. So we help them um, get used to the things that they may see and experience during medical procedures, help them discover how their bodies can work and learn coping techniques um, which they can use during challenging experiences at the doctors or hospital. We did research earlier in the year where we interviewed 100 medical professionals and also parents and carers of disabled children, as well as disabled children themselves. 68% of medical professionals say disabled children find medical appointments challenging, and over a third of all appointments have to be repeated, um, uh, medical procedures have to be repeated because of anxiety or sensory issues. 
Um, 40 per cent of disabled children in the UK are living in poverty and parents and carers are finding it increasingly difficult to be able to keep taking time off work and, and go to hospitals, um, uh, hold down their jobs whilst caring for their child and factoring in medical appointments that often have to be repeated. And obviously it's creating um, a, a burden on the NHS as well in terms of repeated appointments. Parents and carers of disabled children rated attending appointments and medical procedures is 8.5 on a scale of 0 to 10, with 10 being most challenging. So it's a really big problem, and there isn't, there isn't anyone working in the space to try, and, to try and tackle that. It's not surprising when you consider that 75% of GPs have received no training to training of working with people with learning disability, and very few medical students have, um, have much more than a week's worth of, of learning on um, disability awareness. Our content is based around the procedures and the stress points that respondents told us were hardest to deal with. So things like waiting, having to keep still, but also procedures like MRI scans and blood tests. Um, our experiments in sessions are really exciting and wide ranging. We have everything from an EEG maypole, uh, we do syringe art, we make blood potions, um, all sorts of lovely things. Um, I have a quote I wanted to share with you from Emma Stockton, who is a consultant anaesthetist at Great Ormond Street. She says, Children with learning disabilities find medical procedures and environments challenging and exhibit anxieties over and above non-disabled children. Often in a hospital environment, sensory issues can be magnified. With lights, new sounds, peoples and smells, it can be really overwhelming for them. Not only can this project help relieve some anxiety for children, but it supports parents and carers while making it easier for us medical professionals to administer treatment, potentially reducing the likelihood of medical procedures having to be repeated. I also wanted to share the story of a little girl called Poppy McLean. Poppy is 10 and has cerebral palsy. Her dad, um, her dad says, medical appointments from visiting the GP through to hospital tests are extremely challenging for our daughter and also the whole family. Because of her learning disability, Poppy's fears can be quite literal. So if she's having a brain scan, she thinks they will remove her brain. Or for an eye test, that her eyeballs will be taken out. Her anxiety and stress, both in the build-up, this can be a number of weeks prior, and the anxiety that she suffers during appointments, which often lead to failed attempts, is hard to say the least. Being a parent of a disabled child, we have to attend medical appointments almost every week. So having to rebook failed appointments causes greater strain and stress with the additional complication of having to constantly have time off work. And Poppy explains in her own words, I feel nervous when I have to go to hospital. I worry how long it will be. There's a lot of waiting which I find tricky and new people who I don't know. It's hard for me to stay still. Sometimes when they talk about me, I can hear my name but don't always understand what they're saying about me. I worry that I might die. I worry what they're going to do with me. It's very scary for me. So with Poppy, we worked with her. Um, one of her, the biggest things that she struggled with was going for an EEG. She couldn't tolerate having um, the, the little sticky things on her hair for, for sensory issues. And she used to have huge meltdowns at the hospital appointments. So we worked with her family, and a little bit like you can see in this picture, um, we, got, we asked the hospital if we could borrow some old EEG wires. We EEG'd her favourite teddy. Uh, we all walked around with silly hats on, and we made it really, really fun. Something that simple meant she was then able to go back to hospital and have her first successful EEG after four, repail, uh, four failed attempts. And actually, they discovered brain activity that they weren't expecting were able to quite um, significantly change her medication as a result. So not only are some of the techniques super simple, really cheap, really easy to do, but potentially really life-changing as well. We want to have a long-term impact, so we showcase our techniques to medical and education professionals to integrate into their own delivery. And for parents, we provide take-home materials and worksheets. So for the human body workshop, uh, workshop our parents have um, a, a pack of tips and suggestions which we've pulled from other parents and carers. So it's very kind of co-supported, tried and tested. Again, often really simple things that can make a big difference. We also give them simple take-home experiments that they can do um, with easily found um, items that you can find around the house to extend home learning. 
So our tier two for sensory science is our work experience programme for young disabled adults. We want to break down the, the barriers to science as a career for all, including disabled children, but we also work with those from lower socioeconomic groups or facing other life challenges. We also inspire employers to think differently, and we want to raise aspirations for careers in STEM. Jessica Butler, who's a science teacher at New Fosway School um, in Bristol, sums it up perfectly. She says, all too often, disabled children are overlooked in the area, with people assuming they will be unable to participate. Yet actually, science has a great appeal, particularly when applied practically, as children can begin to learn that there is no right or wrong way when exploring, and things can go wrong, which is fine, a valuable life lesson that children with special needs need to learn. It can even offer a, variety, a viable career path for some of our children. All special needs students can benefit from sensory science. For some, it's to support what the session's about. For others, it's a reinforcement to further or scaffold or consolidate learning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Um, our next speaker um, is Graham Price. Uh, Graham is CEO of the recently formed University Schools Trust, UST, and is also executive head teacher of St Paul's Way Trust School, um, uh, which actually is the lead school within that trust. And uh, I'd like to invite Graham and he's going to share his thoughts about. Um, school curriculum and uh, breaking down barriers there. Yes, right. Thank you. Um, well, very, very good afternoon to everybody. I'm going to start with um, an admission. I'm not charismatic and I'm not a super head. I'll start with that. Um, but I, I will say that I am an archetype. I, you know, if you talk to the community that I serve, I'm an archetypal head teacher. I'm tall. I'm white. Um, and uh, I'm middle-aged, <laughs> and I'm a man, and rather like the portraits that we've got here around us. Um, and that presents certain issues, and I think that um, one of the ways that I've sought to encourage the, the, the girls um, in my school to think about science is to tell them about my experience of studying English. I was one of only two boys in my English A-level class, and I, I knew how it felt when suddenly a big question was asked, and then all the heads turned to me to give the answer around something to do with gender, or indeed what the girls will often tell me is that the heads never go towards them in their science lessons to give the answer. But for me to be here today at the Royal Society talking about science seems to be quite an extraordinary thing. Um, you know, I am an English teacher, deep down, so I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. What I'd like to talk about is how I believe that the UK education system has systematically undermined the teaching of science over a, project, project, uh, a protracted amount of time. I'd say, and particularly for young people in those areas that are considered to be the most challenging schools, so the, 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 the bottom quartile of schools, I suppose, or the top quartile in terms of children who are receiving pupil premium or children with English as an additional language, those youngsters. Because it was those schools that were most delicate and those schools that had to chase the league tables. Because if it didn't, they feared closure. And it started in 1992 with the 5A to C um, benchmark. And schools were told if you didn't get to a certain point, well, that meant that um, you, you know, were going to be closed, basically. And schools such as the one I took over in 2009, uh, St Paul's Way Trust School, um, went with that 5A to C benchmark, hook, line, and sinker. They became an art specialist school and a great number of those youngsters, what they got at the end of their um, education at 16 was a BTEC in art and design worth four GCSEs and um, GCSE art. 
and often the coursework's being used for the same thing. Where was English? Where was maths? Where was science? Of course, where was modern languages? Um, so that's, that's where I believe the rot started to set in. Um, moving on from that, uh, it was 14 years later, I think, when we actually got to a point where um, the government said, well, actually, we're disadvantaging um, groups of children. This isn't a balanced curriculum. And they said it had to be five ATCs with English and maths. Where was science? So that was in 2006. And then what happened was that schools scrabbled around. They did everything they possibly could to get the achievement of youngsters in English and maths as high as it could. They gave them more English more maths, and they chased that benchmark. And then they thought, well, and then we'll find three easy subjects to make the five. I'm not saying that that was um, something that people did, having thought about it carefully, and they, they decided to sell those children down that, that, that avenue. But I'm saying that there were pressures placed on the system that meant that so many school leaders went down that avenue. It wasn't until 2010 when people started talking about the EBAC again. But this was after the science had been removed from English science, maths at Key Stage 3. Well, all of those went in 2009. And at Key Stage 2, um, of course, we had the situation where um, the English and maths sats stayed, but science was, was taken away. Very recently, there's been a report on science teaching in primary schools. And the current estimate is that um, in every week, primary age children are doing one hour of science a week. And I would say it's a direct legacy of the fact that um, science has been treated in the way it has been for such a significant period. So um, EBAC was floated, hugely aspirational. We're going to get children to do English, maths, science, uh, modern languages, and the humanities. Well, I don't know how aspirational that is, because I did that when I went to school. And actually, it's broad and it's balanced. We can talk about whether that squeezed the arts, but I don't feel that in, if, if your curriculum is managed correctly, that it does squeeze the arts. And that certainly isn't the case at St Paul's Way Trust School. We've got very healthy arts provision. Um, but EBAC, it was mentioned, it was put out there. People started to report on it. But it's only now that it's starting to be part of the Ofsted framework. So you've still got a situation where you've got schools that are considered good by Ofsted. And they've got maybe, well, I, was, I went to a school. I'm a national leader of education. I went to a school recently. And only 1% of the youngsters were getting that group of qualifications. And only 5% were being entered. So we've got, a, we've got a curriculum issue in the UK. That's the problem. Um, and that's some of the, one of the things that uh, uh, needs to be addressed if we're going to create the scientists of tomorrow. And the, the youngsters that are most disadvantaged by this curriculum are those youngsters in those most challenging schools. Um, other schools, and I was talking to uh, the chair of this group um, uh, for this afternoon, and um, he was saying that he lives in York, and the secondary schools there um, have got very good science provision. Those schools were never under the same threat. We talked about those schools. I know some of those schools. Um, but I'm talking about a particular group of schools which do if we're serious about diversity, um, need to have just as good a curriculum as if you go to a middle class, generally middle class, um, school in York. So um, we, we've got this situation. Um, that's the problem. St Paul's Way, uh, we've tried to come up with a solution. When I arrived in 2009, um, the situation was that no child did triple science. Uh, there's the Jewel Award, some of you may remember that, and there was the BTEC science, which the majority of students were doing. 
Um, if you went into many lessons, it felt like social sciences. You felt there was a lot of geography going on. You felt there was a lot of RE going on. But I didn't see much practical science going on. And um, my, my, my view was that for us to move our young people, because at this point, St. Paul's Way was in a terrible state, couldn't get to that, that benchmark of, uh, or floor target of 30% um, 5 ACs with English and maths, had to do something. They'd been making the kids do more and more and more English, more and more maths, but it wasn't working because actually they'd switched off. And um, I said to the then the IEB, Interim Executive Board, Governors have gone, I said, well, let's become the first Faraday school in London. And they said, what's that? I said, I'm not quite sure what it is. I've heard about primary schools are doing much more experiential science, but I think that's what we need to do. We need to have um, a much more engaging curriculum. And um, the school needed some big bangs in the right way. I had lots of bangs. They were not the right sort of bangs. Um, and we need science teachers to feel that they could get back to uh, making the curriculum exciting and dynamic with lots of practical activities. And uh, what that meant was we introduced deep learning days. So for all of the year sevens, whole day of science, once a fortnight. And that was replicated in year 10 as well. It meant chipping away at other curriculum areas. But I was convinced, I'm an English teacher, that if we could get the youngsters thinking in a scientific way, if we could get them really exploring what's around them, if we could get them really fired up by seeing you know, the natural world around them in a different way, that that would engage them. And they would see why it's so important that they've got good literacy skills, why they've got good maths, you know, because they would see the application. Uh, and it has worked. Um, it's been a huge team effort, and that team has included a lot of support from outside agencies. The IEB was removed, uh, well, they, they, they did their, their work, and a trust was set up, led by Queen Mary, University of London, and other trustees quickly came on board. King's College London uh, are with us, UCL are with us, um, University of Warwick, University of East London, University of Greenwich. Um, it's, a, it's a great group of people. And what I would say is, if you get a, a, a group of institutions like that in a room, there's absolutely no way that they're going to say, let's concentrate on English, maths, and three others. They want to know what's going on in science. And what we've done is we have um, done a number of initiatives. Uh, I can't talk about all of those today. I'll mentioned a couple of them. We introduced the Science Summer School, Brian Cox, who of course um, is linked to the Royal Society. He helps us with that every year. He comes, he talks to students from the school, but also students from neighbouring schools about being a scientist, and he really you know, brings that big bang factor year on year, and we're so grateful for that. But he brings with him a lot of colleagues as well, and a diverse range of colleagues. So our youngsters see role models in terms of what it can be, uh, you know, who can be a scientist, and that's you know, proved invaluable. That happens um, every year, as, as I say. And we, at those um, uh, conferences, Science Summer School, we invite parents to come to an evening function. And we invite our parents to see their children as potential scientists. And we show them that actually, Scientists are people, are people, are people, just as we are. Um, a, another initiative which I think has been incredibly um, helpful in terms of us breaking that ceiling for our youngsters in terms of getting into the best universities has been the Authentic Biology Project funded by the Wellcome Trust. Um, here, our sixth formers do real DNA research. They're doing it into diabetes, and they're doing it with academics from Queen Mary. Um, and then, of course, if they have an interview or in their UCAS form, they talk about that real research. It's a practical application of science. Um, the outcomes of that is that you know, we are getting young people who were not getting into Russell Group universities into those universities. We're getting them into Oxford and Cambridge as well, um, which we're very proud of. 
On that, uh, a few statistics, I suppose. Um, when I arrived, uh, no child was doing triple science. And they weren't being taught by specialists. And currently, today, um, we've got a situation where in state schools, only 30% of the teachers in teaching science teach their specialism. In independent schools, it's over 90%. Um, now, uh, youngsters are taught to their specialists, as taught by specialist teachers, and I've got about a third every year doing triple science. They're not forced to do triple science, they're, they're wanting to do triple science. And the boy girl ratio is very healthy. It's about 45%, 55%. Um, so that's 80 out of the cohort of 240. Uh, we've also got a situation where um, uh, our A level, um, 60% of our youngsters are choosing to do STEM-related uh, A-level pathways. And um, this year, of our year 13s, 98% went on to university. And those that didn't go on to university went on to level four apprenticeships, which um, you know, we're really proud of. And of those going on to university, 60% went on to study STEM. And of those, and this is the statistic that we're really pleased with, it's about 50% boys, 50% girls doing those STEM degrees. So we think we've got something quite exciting now, and that's why we've created the University Schools Trust. And the idea of that trust is to replicate some of this work. We've opened another school, the Royal Greenwich Trust School, but we also want to work with other schools uh, and with other universities that are grappling with this issue how do we make sure that no child is in a situation where the system is precluding them the opportunity to participate? Thanks very much. Thank you, Graham. Um, the next presentation is actually a bit unusual. It's a, a double act. Um, and the double act comes from Kantar Public UK, and it's related to um, computing. I think there's been a report from Royal Society. So the, the double act consists of George, George Kiriakopoulos, and Peter Matthews. And uh, I don't know who's... who's and George. George is going to be on first. And uh, so let's thank George and Peter for coming up. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, for this session, we will take you through some findings from a, research, uh, from a recent piece of analysis that Canto Public uh, conducted on behalf of the Royal Society. Uh, the analysis is very much focused on uh, computing. However, there's uh, findings coming through that are very relevant to, to, to today's agenda. Uh, the analysis is focused on three domains. Uh, first, we will look at schools that offer uh, computing at key stage four. Schools that offer access to computing education. And we will investigate some of key characteristics. Uh, then we will focus on pupils who take up computing GCSE and explore uh, environmental and uh, individual determinants uh, behind this decision. And lastly, we will focus on uh, pupils who decide to take uh, up uh, computing A-levels and then again explore uh, drivers behind this decision. Uh, I will not say much about the method, but we're very happy to answer questions. Uh, the only thing I want to uh, mention is that the analysis that we're presenting is completely based on administrative data sources that were linked together and refers to the academic year 2014 15, which was the most recent year at the time that the analysis was done. And it's a very interesting year because it's right before big changes in, in, in uh, education policy uh, relevant to computing. So it gives us a very good sense of, of baseline. Uh, however, there have been some additional publications since then. And where this was possible, uh, we checked uh, our figures to make sure that uh, <coughs> patterns that we are discovering uh, still hold. And I'll be commenting through that. Uh, in the process. So first on access, the first thing to note is that the academic year 2014-15, uh, we have 45% of pupils being at schools where 
computing uh, is offered at key stage four. Uh, now, the, the year after that, 2015-16, the equivalent figure has uh, increased rapidly uh, up to 70%. This is a substantial step change uh, that we would need to investigate further and, and understand what it means. Going back to the 2014-15 data, uh, we explored uh, variations of, of access uh, to, uh, to computing uh, in terms of um, uh, geography. So the, the corpulent math on, on the uh, left-hand side uh, shows uh, counties in England and, and the corresponding percentage of schools offering computing at key stage four. And even though there's not a very clear geographical pattern, you can see there that the, uh, the range is, is, is very wide, so we have areas where the, this percentage is as low as 10%, uh, and then areas where this is as high as 80%. And we have explored the idea that this, this, this variability is perhaps linked with uh, deprivation at a local level. So the bar chart on the uh, right hand, left hand side, is it left hand? Yeah. Um, um, uh, shows uh, bands of most, uh, from most deprived to least deprived areas and the corresponding uh, percentages of uh, access to, uh, to computing. Uh, of course, this relationship is not perhaps as, as, as linear and as straightforward as this bar chart makes it out to be. There's, there's a lot of variability in there, but perhaps there is a trend that we need to consider. Uh, one last thing before I hand over to Peter to discuss uh, entry and, and continuation issues. Uh, we, the, in these graphs, we, we are plotting uh, access to computing education against uh, school level characteristics. So the first bar chart uh, breaks down access by the number of pupils at the end of key stage four within a school, which is, is a proxy that we use for school size. And there you can see that uh, smaller schools uh, tend to offer computing less frequently. Uh, the second graph breaks down access to computing by school gender of admissions. And then there's a very interesting pattern there with boys' schools uh, being uh, top of the, um, uh, of the rank and then girls' schools, of course, being uh, right at the bottom. Uh, so if that section was about the opportunities pupils had to, whether they could study computing in the first place. The next bit is, um, what choices do they actually make if they are in a school which offers computing? Is there anything we can learn about the kinds of pupils taking up that opportunity and the kinds of pupils who don't? <clears throat> so we built this statistical model. It tries to understand the influence of different characteristics of pupils and schools and where people live uh, in relation to their likelihood to study computing at GCSE level. So we can see where those differences are. So we might be able to answer questions that if you had two pupils who were uh, I identical as far as possible, but one was male and one was female, what does that gender difference mean for their likelihood to study computing? Or, or what about uh, their background in terms of ethnicity or where they come from in terms of area deprivation? And I'll start, first of all, with a kind of broad geographic level, level of looking at this. So the way of reading this is that vertical line here represents kind of baseline. So if we think about regions in the UK, that baseline there is London. The likelihood of studying computing at GCSE if you are a pupil in London after we control for everything else. Uh, yep. UK, Sorry, the England here. Um, the data that this is based on is from the National People Database, which only covers England. Um, so uh, the dots here represent um, the relative likelihood of studying computing. Anything to the right, you're more likely to study computing. Anything to the left, less likely. And in terms of those regions in England, we can see uh, a trend that's leaning towards outside of London. If you're in London, you're less likely to study computing. So that means that there is a, a, a pattern by, by region, by where pupils live. Interestingly, once we control for other factors, deprivation at the bottom, the, the deprivation of the area you come from, has basically zero uh, impact on likelihood to study computing. As George mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, um, there is quite a clear pattern uh, in that pupils in more deprived areas were less likely to be in a school that offered computing. But if their school did offer computing, then, um, then their likelihood of studying it w was not substantially impacted by deprivation. We can also think about this at a school level. 
Um, for today, we've just pulled out three things to think about. One is that there's a small uh, impact, but a significant impact, from teachers having a uh, specific qualification in computing. So if someone uh, is in a school where the, the teachers have a computing qualification, they are more likely to study computing. That's significant, um, sorry, that's similar to other research we've conducted uh, regarding qualifications in physics, maths, biology, and chemistry. So there is this uh, factor around schools and the kinds of teachers they have. School performance was associated with likelihood to study computing, but not necessarily in the way you'd expect. Actually, if you're in a better performing school, then you are less likely to study computing. That's something we'll, we'll come back to in a, in a moment. And uh, single-sex schools. If you're in a single-sex school, you are more likely to study computing. I think that's particularly relevant for girls. So uh, your likelihood of studying computing if you're a girl in a girls' school is quite a lot higher than if you're in a mixed school. And that's not something we really see for boys. I think the heart of this from a diversity perspective, though, is the pupil level characteristics and the differences we see there. The gender gap here is much bigger than any other variable we saw. So males were much more likely to study computing than, than female pupils. There are also clear ethnic differences in that pupils from Asian backgrounds were more likely to study computing, whereas pupils from black backgrounds were less likely. And at the very bottom, there's this relationship with maths. And I think that's interesting. So if you are better at maths, you're more likely to study computing. And there's uh, this quite clear perception among pupils and teachers that, that there's this relationship between maths ability and computing ability. But one challenge that gives for us is are we uh, turning off some pupils who don't consider themselves good at maths from studying other science subjects? And that perhaps schools may be uh, anecdotally encouraging pupils who are good at maths to study computing, people who are less good at maths encouraging them towards other avenues. And there is a danger there in us uh, overemphasizing those patterns in, in other subjects. The step we took after this was to look at the differences going on to A level. So these people are in a school which offered GCSE computing. They took GCSE computing. Do they continue on to A level computing? And in terms of regional differences and geographical differences and school level differences, there's much less of an impact at A level than there was um, for, for GCSE. But some of these pupil level differences are still quite strong. So again, there's this strong gender difference where male pupils were much more likely to continue on to A level. In fact, that gender difference is getting worse from key stage four. Ethnicity is quite interesting in that the direction switches for pupils from Asian backgrounds. So they were more likely to take GCSE computing and less likely to continue on to A level computing once we control for other factors. Those pupils from black backgrounds falling further behind. What we do see with uh, pupils from Asian backgrounds is that they're relatively well represented in other sciences. So in particular, in maths and in physics and in biology and in chemistry, um, Asian pupils are well represented. They're both at key stage five level and then at, at university. So there's perhaps some impact here from uh, pupils having to limit their options now to three or maybe four A-level subjects they can take and that pupils may be prioritizing other subjects. I think that's relevant for what we talk about today because there's a lot of variation within STEM subjects. So even if pupils are staying within the broader STEM, there are still uh, differences in people's backgrounds in the kinds of subjects they feel comfortable taking. So there's this clear difference here on ethnicity, but again, with gender, boys are much more likely to be taking physics and maths and computing if they're staying in STEM, and girls are much more likely to be going through uh, routes of biology, psychology. Um, I think I have a, just a couple of minutes left. Um, but to bring a few of those points together, so first of all, Pupils' opportunities in computing are seriously limited depending on where they live, where they go to school. Characteristics they don't necessarily have much control over. And I think that's relevant as well in terms of triple science. We heard earlier about there are schools where pupils don't have that option at all or where uh, they may not be encouraged to do so. Even if they do have the opportunity to study um, computing or, or triple science or, or other STEM subjects, then we do still see differences in the kinds of people who, who are making those choices, and in particular, this very large gender gap. Um, I think the environment in single-sex schools is a really interesting question here. So what is it about girls' schools that was encouraging, um, encouraging girls there to be more likely to study computing? I think this relates to something Alice said earlier, um, an, an interesting parallel with girl guiding, that if you have uh, an environment that's girls only, then that 
helps get over some of the gender stereotypes that otherwise female pupils are having to fight against. Um, I think it would be really interesting to understand the mechanics of that a bit more and what is that that we can learn from a, a single sex school environment that we can implement in some way in a mixed school environment to encourage greater diversity of participation there. Um, I've talked about the, the difference in ethnicity already, but um, the last point I suppose is around the school performance, that a lot of this is, uh, is related to people's choices, but the people's choices are patterned very heavily by, um, by what schools are telling them, what teachers are encouraging them to do, and what schools offer. And there's this perception that some of these better schools might be encouraging pupils down uh, routes that are useful for applying to university. And that, uh, that may not necessarily involve STEM, and it might not necessarily involve, in this case, computing, if they think someone can get better grades in another subject. Um, I suppose taking a step back, that's not necessarily what's best for pupils. And I think there's an important area around stronger careers advice, stronger subject choice advice uh, for pupils to help them to understand uh, why they're making the choices they are. One thing that um, commonly comes up for, for the gender gap in, in sciences, uh, especially physics and especially computing, is this, this uh, perception of ability, and specifically perception of ability around the maths involved in these subjects. And uh, I think as we heard this morning, you'll find that uh, female pupils who are just as good as male pupils at maths or, or at science may feel that they are less confident in those subjects and therefore be less likely to make those choices. So I think... There is an important role for, for schools in how they guide pupils through making those choices. But uh, underlying all of that, as we've heard several times already, are these very strong societal, cultural differences. And um, we should be trying to tackle those where we can, but this is an enormous uh, challenge that's going to take a very long time to see, see substantial progress on. Having said that, as George started right at this presentation with, <coughs> the percentage of, schools, of pupils in schools offering computing jumped a lot in a very short space of time with changes in the curriculum. Now, I suppose there's a question of how, how uh, schools can then um, suitably offer that with such, such quick change, but it does show that change can happen and can happen quickly with, with the right support, and we can widen the opportunities that different pupils have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I th well, we've had, a, I think, a, a beautiful range of diverse talks and topics. Um, I think the plan is we're going to have some general discussion here, which I'll chair, and then, as I said before, I'll, I'll open it up for specific questions. Um, it's very hard to, to kind of pick on one thing, but one thing that came out for me was the idea, basically, is as with all diversity issues, it's breaking down barriers. So breaking down barriers and stereotypes, whether it's gender, race, or disability. And we've had two main areas in terms of education, um, aspiration, and um, health care. So in terms of a, a general question for the panel, just to kick us off, what do you think about, uh, in a way you concluded with some of these within your talks, um, uh, Alice, I like the way you said about having that freedom um, to be yourself. Mm. Or, uh, um, Catherine, you mentioned about that kind of just simple solutions with GPs. I thought, Graham, you mentioned that last point about no child should be, should be kind of hindered or precluded in terms of the system. Mm -hmm. It looks like the system has failed for quite a number of children. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, Graham, uh, George and Peter, in terms of access to computing, whether in terms of regional or to do with gender and race again. So my general one then to all of you is, what do you think, how, in your particular experience, what kind of, what can be done to break down those barriers uh, in your kind of specific areas? So kind of comments that you would feel that would, you could actually replicate elsewhere. Is there, do you want to start, Alice? Do you want to? Okay. <laughs> right. Um, well, obviously, in Girl Guiding, we have this girls-only space, which means that girls, they're not experiencing these gender stereotypes at all, and that's what we want to see in society. So we want to see a society that even though you've got girls and boys in one place, they're not experiencing these gender stereotypes. So it's just not 
not boxing girls in and leading them to think that you know because they're a girl they can't enter STEM they they they're sort of more tailored perhaps to English as we heard about earlier and um, a lot of, I know there's a lot in the news at the moment about gender stereotyped um, toys and clothes things like that so you know boys from a young age are being given trucks and like those little building kits and stuff and girls are being given dolls and hairbrushes and stuff like that and it's that that segregation of the the genders from a very young age which is really having this massive effect and I think it's starting from a young age to to break down those barriers and just make sure that children aren't being um, sort of uh, exposed to that from a young age which is something we heard in the keynote earlier as well. Mm -hmm. Catherine, do you have any comments? Yeah, I guess from my experience, there's, there's probably two things we do which are really simple and accessible, and I think that's the key thing, it's making it easy for people. So one of the things we do is, with any of our experiments, we always use things that are cheap, easy to get hold of, so often recycling, household items, things that you would be able to really easily replicate at home, so that if we inspire children, they're excited, they can continue their learning when they get home, and we try and empower parents to support them as well. Um, the other thing we do, which, which really helps reinforce some of the academic learning, is we introduce movement into our sessions. Um, and actually, maybe I should get you all up and do, <laughs> doing some movement. But actually, when particularly for children with special educational needs, um, you know, in the middle of our human body workshops, we have a great big, we have a heart party with heart confetti and get them all up and dancing. And I can't tell you what a difference it makes. And I think actually, there's a great synergy between science and movement, actually, and being able to. Um, get people moving and thinking and looking at science in a different in a kind of creative way um, and that really does help reinforce some of the some of the academic learning that that we're trying to get across Thanks, Catherine. Um, well uh, I, I think um, it's about aspiration it's about unrelenting belief in 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 every child and being absolutely um, determined to, to, to open up their minds to the world of possibility that is there for every single one of them. And, you know, uh, I remember when Barack Obama was you know, elected and, and how the whole school community was so thrilled with that. And, and that line, yes, we can, or yes, you can. And, and it's just going back and back and back and saying to those that lack the self-esteem to believe that they can do it, that yes, you can. And through that, you just see those incremental great gains. It's exactly the sort of thing that I think we were listening to this morning, which I, I thought that, that session was, was, was fabulous. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's getting the messaging absolutely right again and again. I agree. In terms of, in terms of confidence is one of the yes. themes of this, yeah. this meeting. Yeah. So, George, um, do you have any? Um, I think that um, I completely agree with everything that's been, been just said, um, and I think we have to recognise that in as much as this is heavily patterned by really strongly ingrained social and cultural factors, it's difficult for us to change at all. But one thing that I think um, would help is for schools to be aware of the ways in which they implicitly or explicitly are guiding their pupils because I feel like we have a little bit more control there over what schools are doing and the ways in which they are encouraging pupils to take certain routes. Because those, consciously or unconsciously, are going to be patterned by exactly the same things that we're, we're trying to fight against here. And I think a particular challenge around there that actually was brought up earlier this morning is this difficulty in our education system of expecting 16-year-olds to pick three or four things that are their... Um, that will then determine their future direction in education and employment. And the challenge there in, in certain subjects being crowded up, especially uh, crowded up by any other subject they might get a good result in. Thank you. Um, well, we have about 20 minutes, which is a good length of time, and I don't want to constrain the discussion from the floor. So as with the morning, we've got some roving mics, and I saw this hand come up first and I will I hopefully we'll get round to everybody because I think we have some time for some good discussion and questions. Hello um, I'm the director of science specialism at a state school in Chelsea we're in the, the most deprived quintile on your, your charts and I think it's interesting how you're talking about curriculum choices so we have a computing department we have specialist computer science teachers and we run it as a course at GCSE and A level and I was reflecting on your your um, comments about the, the maths link at GCSE. Uh, for our students, it, it is very hard. The new computing science GCSE is much more challenging than old ICT. And we run alongside that a multimedia course. 
and to help students choose which one they are more suitable for, we will look at their math. So we won't deter them from getting involved in computing, but it's almost like a, you know, a, a BTEC versus an A-level, which is the most appropriate course for the students, which are they going to enjoy and succeed at? So I wonder how many schools are doing that when you're looking purely at computer science rather than other computer-related level two courses, and I don't know if you looked at that. And then the, the second point that I was, was reflecting on was the key stage five uptake. We have lots of students who enjoy computing at GCSE and got A stars at GCSE in it, probably want to pursue careers in it, but then haven't chosen it for an A level. And that's partly to keep their breadth of options open because they're advised by me and our business and universities link that if you still want to do computing at university in two years time, if you've got a maths A level and a physics A level, you can still go and do computing. If you drop physics to do computing, you can't change your mind and go back and do a physics degree. And so I think it's partly that it's not that they're not interested in computing and are not going to pursue a career in it, but it's about making a sensible decision when you only have three or four subjects to choose from, that actually not doing computing isn't going to be a limiting factor at A-level to getting onto a degree course, whereas not doing maths or not doing physics will limit the range of courses open to you. And so I don't know if that's those two aspects of your research that you looked at, of what other courses are there involving computers at level two that aren't computer science, and also the, the, the progression after A-level onto degree courses in computing for students who didn't necessarily do it at A-level. So the, the research that we were doing was specifically around the, the changes in the computing GCSE. So that was the, the focus there, um, although that is related to then changes and eventual uh, discontinuing of the ICT GCSE. Yeah. Um, to, the, to the second point, I think you've raised some really good points there, and one thing that we did um, think about is this idea that computing isn't seen as useful for making university applications, and that might... Uh, therefore, you may well prioritise other subjects, whether other sciences or other subjects altogether. Um, that's perhaps more specific to computing than, than to other sciences. As you say, you might choose maths instead. Um, but it is a particular challenge you have to tackle in computing. And in fact, computing in general is a bit of an, an, an odd subject in that uh, it's not necessarily perceived as being the same, the same kind of thing as uh, maths or as physics, biology or chemistry and also that you have a huge range in the experience of pupils where they start. So a lot of computing work is uh, kids at home playing around with computers. And, it, and so when you're starting with a class, you'll have some pupils there who uh, actually know an awful lot about computing and are so much further ahead than others who have, have learned hardly anything. Uh, and that's not something that the school can ever do anything about. So, um, I think having different options where uh, pupils from different, uh, with different levels of experience and also looking to get different things out of it is, is a good mode to take. Um, I don't know whether what exactly the relationship is between maths ability and, and computing ability is, um, and I don't think it's necessarily wrong to say that we should perhaps expect that <coughs> people studying computing are on average better at maths than those who don't. Uh, I think what I was more trying to get at is the risk of us pigeonholing pupils based on their other um, on other factors about them, whether that's their gender, but also whether that's their other choices and their the other interests they've shown. Questions? I think uh, blue shirt straight ahead, and then Uta, and then yourself here. Thank you. Uh, Staff, I apologise to Peter for uh, interrupting his talk, but. Um, Speaking as a member of the most favoured uh, uh, demographic, male, white, middle class, only slightly greying at the moment, who's just moved to the University of South Wales, so I'm experiencing, um, yeah, I'm English, so experiencing that, uh, that transition, I'm quite sensitive to that, but, uh, and fantastic, informative, moving presentations that I've got so many questions about, so I'm going to just pick one, which is about, I, I suppose you didn't say anything, Peter or, or George, about intersectionality there, I don't think, about, you know, Asian girls or black boys, is that something you can... You can comment there, because I've got some thoughts that, that occurred from your, your talk that suggested things in that area. Um, if I could actually mention that with some, some previous research that we've done that's about science more, more broadly. So this was um, last year, a study we ran for the Wellcome Trust uh, regarding uh, perceptions and attitudes around science education. And there, um, the clearest differences in things like confidence in your ability in science were between 
white males and white female pupils, and that those differences were much less, if not at all, apparent in other ethnicities. And I think there is a clear intersectionality issue in that um, there's a huge gender difference to start with, but also very clear on average differences between ethnicities. Um, so I, I think that, um, I'd be very interested to hear your, your views on that as well, but I think that, that there, um, the, there is perhaps evidence there that the focus of that uh, gender difference might be within people from white backgrounds. I, would, I was shocked, I think, by, if I understood what you were saying, that the, the access to computing, for example, in, in single-sex girls' schools was low. Is that right? Did I understand that correctly? Yes. Um, and in my experience, they, single-sex schools tend to be grammar schools, which tend to be more aspirational, more better resourced, etc. But maybe I'm misunderstanding the, the demographic there. So I was shocked by that. Um, and I, I also wondered if there was some intersection with, with other groups that, that of, of girls' schools, for example. My uh, expectation there um, would be that the difference is being grammar schools, they're probably better performing schools, they've probably got more pupils going on to university and they may be prioritising other subjects instead. I can't say that for certain, but that would be my... my so why, doesn't that, why isn't that the case in the single sex boys schools? Because they're also... Yes, but I think that might be the, uh, the gender expectations, the expectations of those schools that having uh, only male pupils, they might be more interested in, in computing. It's because the other group I thought that you get a lot of you know, gender s separated schools is in Asian communities, for example, in some Asian communities where they might not be so much on the aspirational side as, as a different reason for doing that. I don't know. I'm just interested to see if it's in the data. Okay, let's, I think Uta had a question. I'm um, Uta Fraser, and I'm the chair of the diversity committee here at the World Society, and I hope that allows me to make a few more general comments rather than your rather specific questions. But I really have to say that this was a, an inspiring session. I, I just so much enjoyed what you're talking about in, in terms of all the different styles of education from special education to specialist education to, well, informal outside school education in girl guiding and indeed to <coughs> completely changing, uh, turning around a school with some absolutely amazing ideas. So just thank you very, very much, and, and, and thank you all for, for being here. I think it's been, it's been a fantastic morning so far. So what I wanted to uh, remind you when we heard the lecture by Sarah Jane Leslie, I had, in fact, a, a, a slight shock when I saw of all the possible disciplines that were being rated for brilliance, education being at the opposite end. <laughs> to me, this was just like, can this be true? Are the Americans all mad? Uh, would we really think that this is the one discipline where you don't need talent, where you don't need brilliance? In fact, however much we should, you know, be aware that this is a, um, you know, should, should not uh, um, exclude the hard work and, and the, um, you know, a cooperative teamwork that's actually needed to do some, some good things. So I, I really hope I, in fact, I'm hoping that if you did that kind of survey in this country, it wouldn't be quite so extreme. Um, education, I always think of as the most, you know, one of the most respected, important um, uh, professions that, that we have that are just really vital for our future. So we've heard examples of, you know, how you've all made a difference. And I think really that, that was inspiring. They're sort of role models in many different areas, which is wonderful. What I would love to ask you, if you have any comments, is what do you think would be needed? Um, what would you wish for to make another step change of difference? What, what could, you know, for example, we do here at the Royal Society to, to switch on yet another gear? Let me start. Do you have any Thoughts? Anybody want to chip in? Catherine? I'd like to jump in on yeah. that, definitely. I think, I think for me, it's having, um, it's just getting <coughs> people to open their minds and be prepared, particularly with um, young adults with learning disability and actually what they are capable of. So the quote I mentioned from um, the teacher from a special school in Bristol, New Fosway School, less than 2% of the children there go on to find work. Um, and most of those go into cleaning, cleaning work. Um, 
but actually when we work with some of the young people in our work experience program and spend time with them and get to know them yes some of them have patchy learning profiles but equally they have incredible skills um, and there are very few companies really waking up to the potential that, um, that, that many disabled people that come through special schools do offer. So, for example, Microsoft is one of the rare ones that have a fantastic programme where they particularly seek out um, people with autism to become coders, for example. And actually, they say they're not doing it just for a kind of CSR nice to do. They're doing it because there's real commercial benefits. Um, yes, they have to make some workplace adjustments. Yes, um, they may have to uh, make sure the environment is... is um, it is suitable for people's needs, but it really does pay dividends for them. So it's, and I think with the, with the cuts in, um, in Brexit on the horizon and everything else, adult social care is less and less supported. So it's more important than ever before that we are encouraging um, young adults with, with learning disability particularly. And for me, I really feel passionately that science does offer an accessible way in, particularly with the 21st century skills that we, that we need as a country need moving forwards. Graham, I don't know if you wanted to make a comment. Oh, what can the Royal Society do? Right, uh, three things, three things um, from me. First is the Royal Society has to have a really strong voice around primary education and needs to talk about how science needs to be um, addressed in primary schools. Um, and I, I know there's some work started on that, but I think it's vital work. Uh, the second thing from me... Um, the, I talked about Brian Cox working with us, and obviously he's, he's connected with the Royal Society. Um, we're looking to upscale the summer schools, and we had a second one in Cumbria um, uh, this year, and that one was particularly aimed at white working-class families um, and really trying to raise awareness amongst that group in, in that area. Um, it's hugely underrepresented in terms of access to Russell Group universities and so on. Um, it went incredibly well. We had 600 um, families that came along, parents who, 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 who witnessed what we were doing there. And I think that if we could roll that out nationally, Royal Society, yeah, look, look at ways to do that. I think that, that would be great. And then um, I mentioned a third thing, and that's around what's happening to um, A-level syllabuses. Uh, the chemistry syllabus, um, the removal of the practical element, um, or the, the reduction again of the practical element. I think that you know we're trying to create scientists. You know there needs to be a voice out there saying that you know if you want great scientists, they need to know what a laboratory looks like. They need to feel comfortable and familiar with asking themselves difficult questions. So that's my wish list. Alice, did you want to? Yeah. So, um, like from the point of view of breaking down gender stereotypes, I'd really like to see um, more women role models for girls in STEM because, sort of, when, when just it's just little things like you know you can see if you, you mentioned it earlier, looking around the room, they're all portraits of men, and it does it's it's really noticeable for girls because they're it's the first thing that they're going to pick up on when they're thinking, oh, I'd quite like to be an engineer. Go around and Google it, and if you click on pictures of engineers on Google Images, you could, you could go through pages, and the percentage of women is just tiny. And it's actually, it's, it's, really, it's really quite a daunting commitment to be able to do that. So I think more role models would really give girls a lift, that, that bit more confidence to then go and say, you know what, I can commit to this career because I know that there, there is a place for me and I have a right to be there just as much as anyone else. Superb comment. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Jenny Dye. I'm the head of diversity at the Institute of Physics, and we've been working for a long time to look at the reasons for, for girls and the lack of uptake at physics and A level. And in recent years, we've done a particular project called Improving Gender Balance around addressing the whole school culture and working intensively with schools to look at how they reduce gender stereotyping across the whole curriculum and not just in science. And we've had some great results in terms of uptake of A-level physics. Obviously, it's very resource-intensive work. And I'd be really interested, particularly with Graham and Alice, to talk about how we can really engage schools in that work. You know, the schools that we worked with were schools that wanted to work on this issue. And, and it's engaging the engaged yet again. And, uh, and also how we engage parents more on helping to address gender stereotypes and, and stereotypes across the board so that they're not just getting the messages through school, they're actually getting the messages more broadly. OK, we've got Julia first and then the person at the back second. So. Um, 
I want to refer back to Sarah Jane's talk this morning. We heard the enormous influence that can be brought on people if they perceive that what is needed is brilliance or talent for a subject. Now, if you talk to people, you read articles in the press, the one thing you will constantly hear is, I was no good at maths. I have no talent for maths. You don't actually hear it so much for other subjects. For science, you probably hear, if you hear anything, oh, I was bored by it, or it wasn't very interesting. You don't hear, I couldn't do science. So we've got this ubiquitous culture, at least in this country, that you need to be something special to be even competent at maths, leave alone good at maths. So I'd like to ask, how can we get rid of that? How can we attack that? How can we show people that perfectly ordinary people can do ordinary maths? Because a lot of them believe they can't. Very good point. Graham, did you want to start that one off? Uh, I'd like to talk about the physics one first, <laughs> if I could, because uh, that really rang a bell with me. Um, we've done so much work trying to encourage our, our girls with, with physics, and, um, and we've, we've made inroads. Um, you know, it's definitely not 50-50 split when I go to my A-level physics groups, but certainly um, there, there's, there's, there's much stronger representation. But um, uh, we really felt we were on to something um, uh, a couple of years ago when um, Alan Rusbridger, who's taken on um, the role of leading Lady Margaret Hall, he came to visit us and he talked about a, a, a new access programme for youngsters for Oxford who, who've just missed. And um, I had um, a girl who was so inspired by her physics and she was so sort of you know, geared up, she wanted to study physics and she really wanted to study physics at, at Oxford and um, we did the introductions, that she, she jumped through all the hoops, she got onto this access course which is mirroring the Trinity access course in, in Ireland which has been going on for a long time, very successful um, and it was all going swimmingly through, through that year and but in that situation she, she was struggling with the level of pastoral care that she was receiving as a young physicist, as an Asian female young physicist. And we saw the, the, the gradual drain in her, in her sense of self-esteem and, and so on. And then at the end of that, the, the physics department, they set a, a test. And she didn't do as well as we all would have liked her to have done, um, although <laughs> she's a very bright girl. And then there was this, this, this big problem in, in the college because they wanted her, but, well, you know, Lady Margaret Hall wanted her, but the physics um, department were, were, were less sure that they did, actually. Um, and she didn't get it. She's gone to King's College London. She's absolutely loving it. She's doing brilliantly with that, which is great. But we've, you know, we've got to take more risks. I think, with our young people. And we've got to you know, let them understand that it's OK to take risks. If we want them to do these subjects, we've got to you know, say that it's not dreadful if, if you fail, because actually you can, you can, you can keep on going, and you, you, know, you can get if, if you really want it, you can get that. Um, so working with an organisation like yours, I think, you know, sounds, sounds great. Um, but we've, what we've got to do is, is to definitely encourage schools to get away from the mindset that uh, which was mentioned earlier that you know you want the child to go to university give them subjects that you know they're going to manage to get the a b grades in and then you know fair enough um, and actually sort of think about the, the the learner and what really turns them on because if things had gone differently, I think she could have stayed on at Oxford. She could have got her great degree, and you know, she'd have been such a fabulous role model for me to bring back to talk to uh, my A-level um, girls that are thinking about physics, or you know, my GCSE students are thinking about physics. But actually, now it feels like a bit of a deficit model because she went to Oxford and then came away again, having not quite met, met the grade. And we can't let that happen. I think. Yes. Yeah. Well, but she. It's fabulous. It's fabulous college. It's, it's it's one of our trustees. But the thing is, we we were in a program where we were looking to try and break down what is actually. I mean, the Oxbridge situation is is tragic in terms of diversity. Well. <laughs> Well, 
the fact that she, her self-esteem is not where it was when she started on that course. And we will, and we do. But it's not that. But the situation is, she went into something. She was, she was absolutely um, geared up for it, and the system. You know, we, we set these things up, but we need to think about the wider implications of when these things don't don't work. And actually, she she is she was very 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 upset when she got that letter letter. After a year at Oxford saying she didn't make the grade. I think rather than prolong it on a single case, I want, we've got just a minute left, but I wanted, there was one who's been waving at me all <laughs> afternoon, so I wanted to include her in. So the last question, sorry. Um, I'd like to look at it a different way. Um, I was very fortunate to be at the same university that Uther was at. She was very inspirational to a lot of us um, young scientists. And I think one thing that she did, and it's ahead of her time, sorry to say this, Luther, um, she kind of um, tried to use social media as well. And we're talking about young people, and I haven't heard a lot about how you're engaging social media. For example, um, Uth, if I remember, the, I don't remember exactly the name of your website. What was it? Shopping and Shoes. No, Shoes and Science. I can't remember exactly what it was. But it was something that kind of like got um, young women who had the potential but may not have been that interested in science because they may have seen it as geeky or they may have seen it as unattractive or not girly, to actually um, approach it in a different way. And I'm just wondering what you are doing to get young girls involved so they can still be women, they can still be girls, they're not just ex only scientists. And also the use of social media, which I think has got a huge amount of impact for our young women. Thank you very much. So I think Alice, so I think I want to okay. give Alice the last word on this. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, well, obviously I'm a young person, so I spend quite a lot of my time on social media, I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I, I mean, I would totally agree with what you're saying. I think social media nowadays is a massive tool to get people involved. And as, a, as an aspiring engineer, I've seen, I, I've seen a lot of stuff about sort of summer schools that I can get involved in and you know different programs that I can get involved in and things like that which really are and I think social media is actually already being used to an extent um, to promote girls in STEM um, I see quite a lot about that I know there's a lot of Twitter accounts and things like that and it's it's really a good way I think for young people to be able to engage with companies and see sort of have that basic understanding of what a company's doing in a way that means that they don't have to actively seek it out so yeah I'd, I'd really agree with what you're saying and um, say that social media is probably the best, is maybe not the best, but it's a good way for young people to access, uh, begin to learn and have more exposure to STEM and related STEM companies without having to actively seek it out. It's, um, and if companies are doing that to promote their, um, sort of what they're doing, then it's a really, really good way to reach both young people and girls to um, promote STEM. Thank you, Alice. Um, unfortunately, We've got lunch and we are over time already. Um, really, I, th I found the talks uh, inspirational, <coughs> enlightening, fascinating. Um, obviously, some of you are there are going to be continued debates about certain aspects and controversial bits. We can't all agree on everything. Um, but I would like all of you to thank the speakers once again for some really fantastic talks. Thank you.